uh, in the UK with the company's perspective, moderated by Konstantin Kotsias, director of Bloomer Europe, and with the participation of um, Carl Gus, UK and I Ireland Managing Director of Ferrovial Construction, um, Nacho Casajus, CEO of uh, CLH, and Alfonso Arabez, Managing Director of Celnex UK. Please. Well, thank you very much indeed for those kind introductions, um, and thank you to Lord Grimstone, Minister Mendez. Uh, Lord Kinley, for, for, for attending today to, um, to give us your thoughts and, and perspectives together with the range of business leaders and investors. So we've heard a lot uh, in terms of the operating environment, in terms of the sort of narrative of the barometer, which I think um, I could sort of summarize as a little bit turbulent at the moment, although some positive signs in there with, uh, as, as Lord Grimstone said, a good weather ahead. So let's translate that kind of policy narrative into a uh, practical business um, response. Uh, I, as was just said, run uh, Bloomberg's um, operation here in the UK. We're a massive inward investor. We've got a huge construction uh, in right next to the Bank of England where we employ 4,000 people. So, so we, we observe this whole de debate about investment, landscape, turbulence, Brexit and C19 very closely. Delighted to have our three business leaders uh, here today. So let me just start perhaps uh, with you, Carl, uh, just in terms of maybe an immediate response to what you heard, which is there is still demand, there is still opportunity. I mean, you're in the in a range of opportunities, infrastructure mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. We know what Ferrovial does. Uh, and then I might come back to you in terms of some of the more sort of choppiness uh, down the road, but but in terms of what you're seeing now, what you've heard, describe a little bit your sort of perspective and, and um, your sense. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I can only really talk um, in confidence from my own uh, sector, which is construction. Um, as Lord Grimshaw uh, touched upon, um, I've not seen a pipeline in construction as buoyant it is at the moment. We have projects to bid that basically we're, we're struggling with the capacity, capacity to do it. So. The whole sort of government agenda about leveling up the country using infrastructure as a vehicle for growth um clearly that impacts sort of my business uh, directly and uh it's a it's a ray of hope uh in a sort of a somewhat uh, choppy climate at the moment but no it, it's um we've probably had our best year for five years um even in the midst of covid um we've um we obviously you know it was quite tricky at the beginning we had people on furlough and uh, we took advantage of the furlough because, you know, some of the businesses had closed down temporarily. Um, thankfully, we brought everybody back and we kept everybody paid on, on full full salary. And I think that's been justified now in terms of, you know, EBITs up this year, revenues up, cash is up. And as I say, the pipeline is is, is, is huge. So, um, you know, I think it's a difficult world out there, but certainly in infrastructure at the moment, I can see a positive, uh, positive ray of hope. That's good to hear. And I think it's consistent. Um, Alfonso, what we, what we were talking about earlier on, which is, you know, from my perspective, um, telecoms, it would seem, would be one of the sectors that could potentially be resilient with what we heard about work from home and bringing forward some of the structural changes in the workplace. But tell us a little bit about, you know, as of today, looking back, before we look at some of the challenges going forward, which we'll, just we'll discuss, the sense of the quality of the opportunity, what you're doing and what you're seeing. <laughs> I think it is, we've got to get close. You. Okay. Uh, you are completely right. I mean, um, if there is something the COVID crisis has shown to all of us, is how the telecom sector has, became, has become 
sorry, um, the CNET for supporting all the other sectors. Uh, it's incredible how the existing networks uh, have demonstrated their resilience for millions of people in all our countries throughout Europe, particularly in the UK, working from home, uh, connecting to video conference continuously every day, uh, having meetings, and that means the networks uh, allowing them to do so. And this is clearly managing a huge in, uh, increase in terms of daily traffic, and they have performed very well. So this is uh, good news. That means uh, probably our sector telecom have been um, is probably being reinforced due to this crisis. But there is uh, a lot of things to do for uh, our future, and particularly in the UK. For example, if uh, this new way of working from home, smart working, will be uh, here uh, for becoming with us after the crisis, which is probably something we are all considering, all big enterprises, big companies are considering that probably in the future we will allow our uh, employees to have more flexible uh, working schemes. This means increasing broadband throughout the country. The UK is one of the countries with the lowest penetration of fiber optics, for example. Okay. Uh, there are uh, several initiatives from the UK government, which in our view are very interesting in terms of increasing broadband, increasing mobile coverage as well. The, the CMS and the mobile operators have signed an agreement for increasing mobile coverage in rural areas in the coming five years. So probably companies supporting uh, the telecom infrastructure, which is our activity, will be key for this project to be a success. And as a Spanish company, we are proud of being part of it here in the UK. Well, it's interesting that the, the, the two sort of or two of the flagship UK government policy agendas, levelling up infrastructure, broadband for all, seem to, despite some of the challenges around, seem to sort of resonate full square with your, your, your business strategies. And it looks like you're positioned, you know, absent. You know, Absolutely. That, that, um, that, that's, that, that's interesting. Uh, that, Natural, let me turn to you for a moment, if I may. Um, interesting business, storage, ports, part infrastructure, part service. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing right now, reflections on what you've heard, the state of sort of confidence. I think when we sort of spoke before, beforehand, it was, you know, there is capital to deploy, there is a strategy to grow, but some of this uncertainty potentially is, is, is constraining that. Yeah, um, from, from our point of view, and being linked very much with the aviation industry, because uh, in the UK, our main service is to um, provide the uh, transportation of fuel to the main airports. Um, of course, we've suffered uh, a big impact with COVID, um, but I would like to make a difference between the short and the long term. So particularly in the long term, and if we talk about something that's been mentioned today, which is a transition to a more green economy, I think it's, it's, ve it's very important that we are um, very clear on the long-term stability because all of our infrastructures require long-term investment, as probably uh, my colleagues here as well. Uh, yeah. And that requires that stability so we know what the rules of the game are going forward. Um, if the rules of the game are clear, uh, we are more than happy and more than willing to invest in making sure that a country, in this case the UK, is flexible enough to get adapted to that energy transition. Uh, we think we can play an important role in that. Uh, and again, that requires changing to sustainable avi aviation fuels, changing to more sustainable uh, ground fuels, but also changing to other ways of energy, which may have uh, an impact on the uh, objective set for the UK government, but, but also for the Spanish government in uh, the decarbonisation of the economy and becoming carbon neutral in 2050. Uh, in our case, what we, what we see is the short-term impact is huge. Obviously, uh, because we have long-term contracts and we, have, we are a basic infrastructure provider, we have to keep operating. One of the main uh, and most important things for us is keeping, in, in, uh, the same as in Celnex, uh, is keeping the security supply. And we've done so through the crisis and we want to continue doing so. Um, and for that, we need to require 
uh, we need to we need to invest a lot of money. That's a that's a main requirement. And and again, the main thing for us is having a very clear path going forward, um, stability in terms of regulatory environment or framework, and making sure that the government is um, committed to the renewal of the infrastructure, which is very much needed, I think, in the UK, as as we all know. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. I think that's a good segue in terms of policy stability, rules of the road, to turn perhaps to some of the potential headwinds, two of which we've talked about, um, the pandemic and Brexit. But let's let's start on Brexit. And I think here we all are running businesses. Um, we've heard some positive mood music in the last couple of days. That will, in the usual ritual war dance, probably become negative before it comes positive again. Um, I think all businesses that I speak to just say, give us clarity, because we can just work with clarity, almost good or bad, give us something to work with, plan around, all of the scenario planning that we've all done. Um, give us your sense in terms of what a, a good outcome would look like based on the context that we currently are dealing with for your, for your business. And, and, and perhaps elaborate a little bit on what a potential bad outcome could mean and what the implications might be. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, from our industry, we're, we're very sort of UK centric. Um, <clears throat> we're not exporting anything particularly, um, apart from knowledge, um, but uh, in terms of selling goods across the continent. So uh, our view is slightly different. I think from a personal perspective, I think the biggest issue with Brexit is the, the uncertainty. You know, um, the UK is a democratic country, um, regardless of the rights or wrong of Brexit, and we won't go there. Uh, people have, have, have voted for it, and I think it's taken a long time. I think industry generally just wants wants it over and done with. You know, I think um, as the minister uh, mentioned today, you know, the UK government's wanting a positive outcome, and uh, listen to our Spanish colleagues today as well; they're wanting the same. So, I think that's all that industry wants. I mean, clearly, I think there's going to be some short-term upheaval because that's with everything that's going on at the moment. Um, that will probably get masked with the impacts of COVID as well. I think the two things meld into one. Um, clearly, in terms of talent, uh, one of the key um, benefits that Ferrovial brings is we are now a local UK infrastructure provider. Uh, you've got a local MD, but we have a lot of um, Spanish talent that we, we bring across. Um, at the moment, obviously, that's been uh, much of the phone call to bring the, the people across to help. You know, obviously, once the visa change is going to be slightly difficult, but again, the planning's in place to, to deal with that. So for us, I think it's just, we just want certainty, really. And then we just get on and, and deliver what we need to deliver. It's a, it's a common theme. Alfonso, um, telecoms businesses, pan-European regulation, some local regulation. I think the sense I got beforehand was there are growth plans and there are strategic plans. How is Brexit informed, constrained, or somehow altered that lens through which you sort of look at your your uk strategy honestly brexit shouldn't affect a lot um what um in in our sector what uh, people's expectations are and i mean today's uh, we we live in a completely globalized world where everybody is attending a presentation of the new iphone or uh, waiting for uh, the new deployment uh, canadian company has performed for an operator there to come into europe so uh, i mean we live in a world where information travels uh, very fastly and everybody is aware of what the americans have or what the germans have or what the spaniards have that means um, in terms of um, impact of Brexit in the telecom needs of the population or uh, the public investment, for example, for um, um, carrying new projects uh, ahead. I think that probably Brexit will not be changing a lot the landscape, but uh, our message should be, of course, totally agree with Nacho in terms of uh, stability. I mean, we are companies investing in infrastructure. That means long-term contracts with revenue streams insured for a lot of years and uh, political decisions can impact uh, yeah. a lot that potential uh, negotiations but on top of that i think that what brexit should have to the uh, british population is new investments in other things 
that means technology, for example, uh, research and development. In the UK, there's a very good tissue of um, spin-offs from universities. Now we are facing all around Europe the deployment of 5G and new technology and mobile networks that should be not only a revolution in terms of communications for people, but also for industries, okay? And uh, robotics and, and uh, artificial intelligence, etc. So what we ask from Salnex to the UK government is beyond ensuring that the political framework will be stable for the future, of course. Uh, let's see if there is investment uh, fostering initiatives from universities, from um, research centers, and let's put the UK as number one in the world in terms of new developments. I think there's a, I think there's a Mr. Dominic Cummings that has that top of his <laughs> skunk works and, and disruptive innovation. Um, just quickly be before I, I move to you, Natural, do you think, has at any stage in the process any of the points of the Brexit negotiation paused a strategic investment or given you cause to kind of park it or has it just been scenario plan scenario plan and move ahead honestly at Selnex, we don't expect any change in our investment uh, policy um, we are now a british company operating in the uk right um, very much like uh, ferrovial so we don't foresee an impact on our local activities we are not exporting we are pro i mean supply and services to the local right. operator the local public bodies okay so no impact in terms of being scared of Brexit, Brexit but uh, we want to see if there is a new environment created by Brexit and uh, not only selling it, all the Spanish companies maybe can take advantage of that. Yeah. Okay. Slightly different landscape, operating landscape for you, Nacho, you know, ports, infrastructure, oil containers, I would imagine, you know, bonded warehouses, um, customs, tariffs, front of mind, your perspective, your concerns on on where this could land? Yeah, in, in our case, I, I'll start saying that our case is pretty much the same as my colleagues here, because we are a British company operating in a British environment. We don't really import anything, although we do, uh, our customers do. And uh, particularly now with the uh, refineries and the production facilities in the UK um, uh, basically shutting down, uh, it's, it's, uh, the UK has become a, a net importer of all related energy products. And that means that we have a big dependency from, uh, from, uh, from the imports. Most of the imports come from uh, outside of the EU, although I would say that there's a big chunk of, of imports yet that come from uh, European ports and they need to comply with uh, European regulations. There are many regulations in our sector, such as REACH or, uh, or the, or the uh, European regulation for uh, inter, inter or transnational um, exports of goods. The, um, the main issue for us would be um, a change or divergence in, in terms of that customs uh, policies, uh, because if that happens, it creates just another barrier for the, uh, for the imports. It simply makes it more difficult and uh, is not particularly important in the long term, as long as it's clear yeah. and as long as we do have time to adapt. One of the things that happens is that we, we know for sure that things need to evolve, and that's absolutely fine, uh, as long as things are prepared with time and that we are flexible enough in the transition periods to, to make ourselves uh, adapted to it. And we've, we've demonstrated a long, a long time that we can adapt to almost anything, and that's not an issue at all. But I think it's the timing um, that's important here. So that's why the, the sooner we have clarity, the better for everyone. Otherwise, we may face uh, a bit of a chaos at the beginning, and that's obviously not good for anyone. Because in, in our case, given that we provide a basic service to the, to the country, um, if it's not clear, any delay or constraint on that initial period may have a, a deep impact throughout the whole economy, which is not, not visible maybe in the first term, but it's, it's certainly uh, a hiccup that can, uh, that can have uh, further Better impact in the economy. So, yeah, we, we basically are um, seeking for clarity and as soon as possible. That's, I guess, a common theme here. Yeah, I think you'll hear that from most businesses and, and, and investors. We heard from the minister and we heard from in the opening remarks, and, it, and it's, a, it's a theme that cuts across the barometer that Britain remains fundamentally to Spanish investors open, mature, good, um, 
good talent, easy to do business. Is that still your sense? Are there any areas where you feel, whether it's bureaucratic or whether it's planning or whether it's some of the issues in different sectors for different issues, where you could say post-Brexit, this could be an opportunity for UK policymakers to, to, to tweak, to enhance something that would, would facilitate or advance your, your business agenda? Is there anything that you, you guys are thinking about in that sort of post-Brexit environment that could be actually a positive? Um, yeah, I think, um, I think the UK is a very sort of liberal um, place to work at the moment anyway. Um, I think it's very open um, for investment, hence the reason why we're all here. Um, and I think done in the right way, that is a huge positive for a for Spain, for example, and B for the UK, because we we bring the best of both worlds. I mean, in Ferrovio, we have what I would call locals and Spanish working side by side, and we're bringing that that learning to the UK, but we're also exporting it back to Spain. So there's a sort of symbiotic right. um, relationship there. I suppose the only, uh, not a negative, but um, with the UK being very open, been open to the right entities, uh, competition is great. Competition for, let's say, some sort of state back entities to get a foothold in the UK suddenly doesn't make competition so great. So I think we just got to watch that a little right. bit. But, right. um, but apart from that, I think the UK, you know, the way it, it's, it, it's, it's set up and it's very liberalized sort of model is, is very, very positive, you know. Um, as we said before, you know, touching on the, on the previous answers, you know, uh, stability. Uh, knowing what we've got to do. Um, most of us now are, if you like, trading internally, not trading out. I mean, if I was an exporter here, I might give you a different answer. Right. But um, for the moment, you know, I think um, slightly turbulent, but outlook positive, I think. Alfonso, your thoughts? I totally agree with him. I, think, I don't think that there will be a negative impact, at least immediately, in our big industries where investments are, I mean, looking ahead 25, 30 years. It is important to ensure that uh, Brexit doesn't change the stability in terms of um, conditions to invest, or that maybe companies not being British are maybe um, less welcome, or um, I mean, uh, facing additional problems they haven't got in the past. This is probably not. Uh, likely to happen because the UK market has always been one of the best places to invest. I think, uh, and I mentioned it before, I think what we should uh, detect after Brexit is that uh, more public funding available for projects like smart cities, like uh, public development infrastructure. Uh, for example, there's something in our particular sector uh, still pending in the UK, which is the coverage of the railway. This is uh, mobile coverage, I mean. This is something affecting a lot of businesses. Yeah. It's a problem uh, which is quite common in all Europe, but the impact of railway in the daily commuting in the UK is not comparable to other countries. So this is something okay. uh, the UK, for example, can develop after Brexit with more funding. And, uh, for example, we are living now a similar problem to Brexit in terms of sudden political change affecting the enterprise plans. And this is the, the Huawei ban. I mean, the, uh, some nations in the world deciding not to install uh, Huawei equipment for the 5G networks. Right. This is affecting the MNOs, the mobile operators' plans in the rollout. They accepted the impact of this political decision because this comes from the governments, but this could bring us a delay in the installation of the new services. All the mobile operators are now trying to uh, sign new contracts with other providers, with Nokia, Ericsson, etc. And uh, probably they will supersede the situation right. and uh, the 5G will not be delayed. But it's an example of how a political change yeah. affects the market quickly. And uh, if the companies are resilient enough and robust, they can react yeah. and, and find solutions. In, in, in my case, I, I do agree with what, what's been said here, but um, I would like to add another, um, another angle to this. Um, some of the infrastructure in the UK it's, it's been, has been there for, for ages, and that requires uh, modernization. It requires sometimes replacement, 
sometimes um, uh, just a, a little tweak to make it compatible with the new ambitions that we have as a as a country. And I think the uh, that modernisation requires a friendly environment and a, and a friendly focus from the government, making sure that the reinvestment is supported and, and encouraged. And, and that's probably where um, we can find, I would say, the biggest advantage once we exit the European Union right. and we're not subject to some of the restrictive rules that yeah. apply there. Uh, I think the, uh, that supporting of the, of the uh, change or transformation of industry, I think it's, uh, it's going to be key for achieving all the goals we have in terms of green economy and, and, and modernization of the economy. So uh, particularly in, in, in our business, we see uh, we've just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, a big investment and acquisition in the UK um, for uh, expanding our business lines. So the long term remains absolutely brilliant in terms of in terms of business. However, there's there's a requirement there to reinvest. And, and actually what I see at risk is more the reinvestment rather than the acquisitions. I mean, acquisitions, generally speaking, uh, are you know, uh, a pretty straightforward thing. However, when it's about reinvesting a big chunk of the benefits of the profit that we make here, uh, we want to reinvest it, we need to reinvest it, but we find sometimes uh, you know, ourselves struggling to do so, given the, um, the, the regulation. So I think it's about permits, I think it's about probably taxes or local taxes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think um, deepening a bit the, um, the focus on the, on the government yeah. for this would help tremendously. Well, I'll raise that with the, with the government panel next, and I, I know we need to sort of wrap up in a couple of minutes, but I do hear from different sectors that without any race to the bottom, without any kind of lowering of standards, there is an opportunity for the UK post-Brexit to tweak, modify, so that sectors are unencumbered and then allowed um, to, to operate without the sort of classic negotiation that takes place with 27 member states. Uh, one final sort of question, and if we could keep it brief just for all of you about work from home, and uh, I think you mentioned it, we think about it. How structural and fundamental do you think the shift will be um, once, let's hope, this is all over? Do you think it will be more of a hybrid, or do you think it will look a little bit more like before? Than after, or a little bit more like after than before. Just yeah, I, I, on that. I've said to people that I think we've had a, a revolution in seven months. We would have probably taken us twenty years yeah. to get there. Um, uh, we work from home at the beginning. Uh, we've obviously been in infrastructure. A lot of our people are on site delivering every day in doubt, and we've worked through through the lockdown um, between sort of you know March and, and and July. So it's only right I think that the, the staff and myself uh, are on on site once a week and in the office. So we're we're now generally operating all our sites 100%. The head office is kind of three, three, four days a week, two days at home. And I think that hybrid model is perfect. Um, I think people I speak to, you know, working at home had a novelty for a few months. You know, you saw the kids that you might not see in a week. Um, now, now, now it wears <laughs> off, absolutely. And uh, now you want to come back to work. And I think also, you know, how do you train graduates and apprentices in an office yeah. through teams? Yeah. You know, you bring in a new person to your team, you, you, you can't, you can't, that cohesion of a team, you can't deliver it um, virtually, you know, it has its place and it's, and it's been a, you know, it's been a godsend, but I think the hybrid model is, I think it's here to stay. Um, Completely agree. Uh, in our particular case, we were until June this year, 20 people in the UK. We closed after the CMA approval, the acquisition of our Kiva's telco business, and now we are 300 people, we will be. We will move to Reading area, and in our plans for the new office, we are considering a hybrid model. So two days from home, three days at the office. Mm. So our new offices will not have desks for everybody. Okay, because we are considering also, uh, I mean, a hot desk scheme when you uh, go to the office because your unit or your department or uh, there's a preparation of a tender and you need to collaborate with people. I think physical interaction is important. I mean, uh, all week from home is probably not sustainable and it affects the business sooner or later. Yeah. You need to be uh, physically interacting with your teammates but uh, it's not necessary to be in the office if there's no 
important meeting to yeah. to celebrate or so hybrid model is the future in our view and this is probably shared <laughs> yeah no exactly exactly the same uh, in our case we were actually on the process of merging the, uh, the headquarters with the with the company we acquired and 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 yeah it's it's exactly as you said uh, hybrid thing is is probably the way the way to go forward and the reason for it is because the exact same reason you said is sometimes you need meetings and you need physical interaction with yes. people face to face meetings otherwise you cannot generate a team you generate a bunch of people working together which is not exactly the same and being a, a, a people person myself uh, I really miss that interaction with with the colleagues with my team and having a, the chance to go in there to the terminals and and showing appreciation live for people uh, people's work that's something that you cannot do through teams in our case we are uh, again based in the terminals and, and and that requires to be physically there but most importantly I think going forward rather than having a fixed scheme of two and three one and four uh, or uh, it's more on demand so uh, certainly on the in, in my case on our leadership team we meet once a week uh, and and that requires to be to be face to face so we choose one day and, and we go to the office but uh, the different teams do pretty much the same and and in the end the office um, is now a meeting room on itself right. so we don't have desks anymore we don't have uh, 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 you know a, a big space for you you, you basically reserve this the set up the office that you want to and then you, you meet with your team uh, and otherwise you work from home uh, and most of it traveling as well through the terminal. So yeah, that's, I think that's a way forward, um, uh, no doubt. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I think that sort of reflects a lot of what we're hearing. I think we have to wrap it up there, um, but thank you, Carl. Thank you, Nacho. Thank you, M. I, th I would sort of summarize that as, as cautiously optimistic for the moment, but pretty confident going forward. So. As Jerry said, you know, the barometer shows good weather ahead, some bumps in the road. Thank you very much indeed for all your thoughts. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.